Hi, welcome to Second Earth Alternative. This is Felipe Osario. So we have a really interesting episode today because instead of actually going over some UFO topics or going over some evidence perhaps, today we're actually going to be reviewing a film called Bob Lazar Area 51 and Flying Saucers. Now knowing my viewers and basically how updated you guys are in all this information, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this movie and I thought, you know, maybe I should just kind of give a movie-like review. Now you might be asking, yeah, right, why should I listen to this guy? But if you're asking for credentials, I, you know, what I can tell you is that I've directed films before. I've had films that have been accepted in film festivals. I've acted in films. I've acted in commercials. Um, Albeit a lot of this stuff was very indie, so take that with a grain of salt. But it, you know, having been around sets, you know, directing projects myself, I feel like I at least have some knowledge to be able to provide to this discussion. Now I also understand that a lot of this footage is technically copyrighted, so I'm just basically going to show enough to be able to make a technical critique about it, and, and, and nothing more. So now, if you never heard of Bob Lazar, you know I. I I'm not gonna go too much details. I'm just gonna recommend that you watch a video. He was basically a whistleblower who in 1989 came out courageously talking about the idea that he back engineered UFO craft. So I'll just leave it at that. So I wanted to ask you guys, did you like the film? So I guess I'll just start off with that. I, I would say I was actually kind of surprised uh, in a pleasant way. I thought Jeremy Carbell, the producer, director of the film, I thought he did actually a pretty decent job. Uh, I actually really liked the uh, way that he kind of pitched himself as this kind of nebulous character who wasn't certain if Bob Lazar was telling the truth, even though, you know, obviously if he's making this film, he knows that Bob Lazar is telling the truth. But I just liked it because it kind of put a f form of skepticism. You know, you can't just make an argument and, and, and only give your side. In a way, you have to challenge the very points that you're making. And I thought he actually did a good job. In, in a way, almost framed himself as a character in doubt and, and trying to figure out whether all of this can tie together. And there was kind of that cool little montage scene with Bob Lazar kind of blowing up and getting upset about the fact that, you know, people are not really believing him. One thing that people say about your story and your experience is that that you were a puppet, a marionette, that you had no control over what was going on at that time, that you, you were taken advantage or compromised and you're being used as a source of disinformation. And what evidence to support that? Right. That, and, yeah, and what's the evidence to support those claims? Is that just something to say? No, I'm just saying that's what, that, that's the kind if of you thing. Have to, if you make a statement, you have to have some evidence to say where the statement came from. So you're basing it on emotion, right. and fear, and you're afraid that I'm right. Um, I thought the editing was pretty good. I thought that the pacing was pretty decent. And um, overall, I would say I'd give it like A minus. Uh, I thought one thing that bothered me a little bit, and actually somebody else had commented on my uh, channel, had commented on my video about, it was this idea that, you know, a lot of the information that they portrayed, it's it's information that we really kind of knew. You know, people who had done research on Bob Lazar were, you know, I don't, I don't think there was anything that was groundbreaking that really came out of this film. I mean, they had all kinds of interesting footage, they had cool footage of Bob Lazar, you know, shooting with a machine gun. I didn't know he had a Uzi. But, uh, but in terms of the actual UFO information, in terms of the details regarding the installation, I always felt a little, you know, I felt a little blanked with that. I, I felt like there was something missing, which is why I didn't give this film a full out A, you know, or however you want to call it, 10 stars, or however you want to rate it, you know. You know, it's not that I doubt his story, it's, you know, it's that I don't believe it anymore, uh, if that makes any sense. But the, but the fact is I do believe in it, so it's, it's kind of like a mute point, you know. It's just I really wanted to see something that was, you know, just that I never heard about before. I mean, you know, maybe he, he gave some kind of detail about the saucers that nobody had talked about. Then I have to step back and say, yo, Felipe, you know, maybe I'm being a little bit too critical. 
because the point is when Bob Lazar did come out with this in 1989, he basically said everything that he wanted to say. But in fact, the only reason that getting this on tape is uh, in show me. I mean, where are those other facts? Just show me what they are. These facts you grabbed together and painted a different story of my life than I did. I mean, I thought I set the record straight 30 years ago. He basically said everything that he needed to say, minus one thing. Uh, let's listen in to w w what's going on here. Element 115 was what we would call the fuel, what provided the power for the reactor to work. What happens with gravity at 115? Element 115 affects gravity. Element 115 produces its own gravitational energy. Your research goes one inch deep, and you say element 115, as he described it, can't exist, and then move on. If you want to be honest about it, and, and dig further into it, and understand it, then you're going to find out that, in fact, what Bob says does make sense. It can be true. Everybody knows the story is that you got some element 115 out of Los Alamos. That, that's public knowledge. Something you said a while back. Do you think that what happened had to do with, with that? Where did I go in there? Are they trying to shake you down to find the 115 that you said 30 years ago that you got out of the lab? People are going to ask that. Yep. So let's just address that. If you feel comfortable addressing it. No. Do you not feel comfortable addressing that? No, I don't feel comfortable addressing it. So there seems to be something going on with this element 115 and that seems to be a discrepancy that i would have liked to know like what happened or at least after 30 years you know now that a feature film is being made on his character i mean you think that you get one more tidbits or one extra information but like i said 1989 he probably provided all of it uh, minus that element 115. we'll get back to that later i actually have a theory that i wanted to talk to you guys about maybe you guys can provide your own uh, feedback in the comment section but one of the things that kind of bothered me was how back in the day when bob lazar first came out with this information he was talking about possibly seeing an alien creature we saw something up here that you think might have been i hate I really hate to say stuff that I, I can't put my hands on and say this is absolutely for sure. Okay. Um, what did you say? I walked down the hallway at one time while I was working out there, and um, there were doors, the doors that go to the hangars, the smaller doors from the corridors, that have a 9-inch or you know 12-inch square window with little wires running through it, just about head level. And I was, as I was walking by, I just glanced in, and I noticed at a quick glance there was... There were two guys in white lab coats um, facing me towards the door, and they were looking down and talking to something small with with long arms. Now, I I was just surprised as I walked by now, and I caught a glance, but I don't know what on earth that was. And then afterwards, uh, it seems that his information switched. So if you haven't seen this, let's take a quick look. People say you saw an alien. Did you see an alien at S4, Bob? I don't think I saw an alien at S4. You know, we're splitting the hairs here. This had to do with a glance through a window that I wasn't supposed to be looking at anyway. And I'm still convinced. I looked in the window, and I think these guys had a doll um, in a small chair, which was you know, similar to what was in the craft. Um, and I think they were just looking at dimensions, and they put something in there. And I just took it a glance, and it was just, you know, something tiny sitting in the chair. I, I don't think there was an alien there posing for him. You know, I think they just had a small character or something, you know, doing measurements or something. Again, we're talking about, you know, like a 400 millisecond glance. So now how much can you see out of that? I, don't, I never saw any aliens walking around there. I never heard anybody saying anything about living aliens. So I don't think... That was it. But they did have a nickname for for the for the aliens. The kids. 
the kids. Okay, so the thing that I didn't get about this discrepancy is that back in the day, Bob Lazar was talking very confidently as and he was mentioning that the guys were talking to this supposed chair sure. that supposedly down, contained a doll. Something you know, small. so I think that was, he was kind of implying back in the day that if people were talking down to something, and not to each other, that you think that would have to be something that's intelligent, That that because why are you talking to a doll? I mean, we're not talking about crazy people, right? Or maybe they are, but the point is, the new version of Bob Lazar talking about this, he was saying that he had, in a way, kind of justified in his mind that maybe they were giving instructions. But instructions to what? To each other? Because that's not what he described back in the day, is that they were talking down to the chair, not to each other. You know, if you're giving instructions or taking measurements, you'd be talking to each other. Granted, he did say it was like a 0.4 millisecond look. And he also was very upset that people nitpick him on all these little issues when when you look at the big picture, it's pretty obvious to a lot of people that this man is probably telling the truth, especially after passing the polygraph test like five different times. But this show is not just for the believers. This show is for everybody who may be doubting. So I just need to go over that, uh, which I thought was kind of strange. Now I wanted to go over uh, what could potentially be evidence that supports Bob Lazar's uh, theories. And, and evidence in, in a sense that it's more like independent confirmation. If you had watched some of my previous episodes about NASA images, there was something that Bob Lazar described in his episode that I actually never knew about. Now this could just be because I'm not the most veteran ufologist, you know, I'm sure there are other people who know about the way that the Bob Lazar was describing how these crafts maneuver, but specifically I wanted to show you this clip because it directly applies to one of the episodes that I put out. So let's take a look. These uh, gravity emitters can be swung all the way up to 180 degrees. And this allows the craft to essentially stand on two of them and hover while this one swings up and creates a distortion in front of it, allowing the craft to slide forward. So that's how their low power mode, uh, Omicron configuration operate. The Delta configuration uses all three and unlike science fiction movies where you see flying saucers just flying along like that, they actually fly belly first. The craft flies along, leaves the atmosphere of the planet, it turns its belly to the destination, the three amplifiers focus in on the destination, and that's how it proceeds. Okay, so what I found amazing uh, was that in this episode, what I was trying to depict were images that were being provided by NASA that seemed to sh indicate that there were UFOs flying across the surface of the moon, or at least near the surface of the moon. But what really shocked me about these images is that when I took these images to the channel filter, I was able to extract what looked like to be a force field around the object. And not does it just have a visual imprint in the image that could be indicative of a force field or a shockwave type energy. In the back of the vehicle, you see almost like a projectile. As if you, as if you can denote the exact direction of the craft. But as you can see, the craft is moving diagonally. And all I can tell you is that when I first published this, that confused me. My assumption was that this craft just moved from like side to side, like, like a plate or like a frisbee. I actually didn't know that they could turn on the side and blast through in one way. So even though I talked about the craft moving like that uh, on my NASA image episode, I, that was something that kind of bothered me that I didn't know. So having watched the Bob Lazar episode and having him describe how the crafts move, I thought that was pretty cool. It's kind of, it seemed to be like a form of independent confirmation that these anomalies could indeed be extraterrestrial crafts. Now that I went over a critique, now that I went over something that I actually kind of thought that supported the story, I wanted to go back to that point that the movie didn't seem to unveil a lot of extra information that we didn't know. But I thought it was really interesting that Bob Lazar keeps refusing to talk about Element 115. Um, and then I start thinking, wait a second, Bob Lazar makes jet cars, right? And he even, in a specific moment in this movie, talked about 
the power of firecracker. Yeah, to take, you know, a large amount of energy, which would normally be thought to be out of control, to take that and harness it and have it do what you want has always been impressive. Bob Lazar loves the concept of being able to use science to control power. You know, think about that concept, using science to control power, using your intellect to control what normally would be insurmountable. Chaos, how he pulled out of it, you know, he dug deep. I mean, it's a pretty incredible story. And in, in his experience, you know, having been shot at, you know, having his life threatened at one of the most secured bases in the world, you know, he, his life was in danger. For him to have come out of this would have required incredible maneuvering, incredible astuteness, you know? And what amazed me was this idea of element 115, right? And then think about Julian Assange. How did Julian Assange manage to protect himself from being assassinated? He created a death encryption key. Meaning if anybody kills him, there goes the switch and the flood of information that he has reserved for his passing, probably very sensitive information, otherwise he wouldn't have used this to safeguard his own life. That would come out if he were to die. So then if Julian Assange created a safeguard, why wouldn't Bob Lazar do the same? I mean, it's like, you know, it's like taking a huge explosion and trying to find a way to contain it. You know, like, like the firecrackers that he was packing. So then you have to wonder, was element 115 taken and is it hidden somewhere to essentially safeguard Bob Lazar's life? So again, I don't know if Jeremy Kerbal intended this in the film, uh, but it seemed to kind of naturally make sense given, you know, what other smart people do to protect themselves. Anyways, that is the episode for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me in this one-of-a-kind episode, a movie review. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. This is Felipe Osorio, signing out.